Namaskaram and hello to everyone. This is perhaps the shortest comeback in the history of this show, Expressions Espresso. Just back with all of you in five days' time. Like how a part two episode of the same guest happened for the first time ever last week. Of course, I had forewarned all of you in my introduction last week that you need to put on your seat belts. And I think it was appropriate as the journey with Padma Bhushan awardee Sangeeta Kalani D. Sri T. and Seshukopalan Sir was certainly an adventurous one. What with his precise recalling of names, of anecdotes, experiences, and fun filled, fun filled, humorous repartees. I realized when I rewound and saw the episode that I was just smiling throughout, absorbed by the mirth and facts put across so lucidly, truly a collector's piece that was. Thank you viewers for your complete involvement and participation in the episode and the comments and the feedback that have been flowing in are still flowing in. After insights from the senior stalwart, this week we have young minds in the foray. The upbringing of our guests this evening has been surrounded always by music and they hail from a grand, tall legacy. With so much music around them, it is but natural for them to get absorbed into the fold and becoming, have to become, promising chips of the old block. Our lady guest is described as a third generation prodigy who is a singer, songwriter, and the dean of SAPA, Subramaniam Academy of Performing Arts. In 2014, she co-founded the SAPA in Schools program that impacts 30,000 students every year and has been credited with building an ecosystem for music education from scratch. She plays as part of two bands she formed with her brother, Subramania and the Thai Sadam Project. On the other side, she has five cats and all of them are named after ragas, besides, of course, one daughter and a nephew. According to her, between the circus of seven beings, her life is rather overfull. Her brother gave his first stage performance at the age of seven and has received many recognitions, including the Ritz Icon of the Year Award, the Rotary Youth Award, two Global Indian Music Awards. He's also a part of SAPA along with his sister. He was recently featured as a soloist in the background score of the film Sardar Udam, composed by Shantanu Mitra. He also co-hosts the SAPA show on Shankara TV to teach global music to young children across the world. He's a youth delegate of the United Nations for the Sri Chinmoy Peace Meditation Group. The lesser known side of him, he loves math and cricket. So if he wasn't a musician, he would have probably done something that involved one of these or maybe both of these. He loved playing chess and board games during his younger days and now enjoys watching and playing cricket. He has become a trekker recently. It is my pleasure to welcome the Subramanian siblings, the children of the legendary Dr. L.S., Dr. L. Subramanian. 
Welcome to Expressions Espresso, Bindu and Ambi. Hi, thank you so much for having us. We're so, so, so delighted to be here. It's, 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 a such, an honor. it's such an honor to be here and, and really thank you so much. Thanks. So we go straight to the questions. But before that, uh, I'd like to welcome you both with a small bouquet. Maybe ragas, maybe kritis, I don't know what comes to my mind. <laughs> of something that you like. That was specially put together for you both. That was amazing. What a privilege. What a privilege. I think, I, I think by far this is the best book we've ever received. I know. I know. <laughs> Thank you. So now I'm going to be, you know, kind of spacing the questions between B and A. And you know who B is and who A is. <laughs> so okay. now it's very well known that both of you have grown up surrounded by music, surrounded with music. And you've been literally swimming in music with such legends at home. So Bindu, at any point of time, did you feel pressurized to take up this profession just because your family was in it? Or... Did it just happen seamlessly? I think there are a few different angles to that. One is that there's always this sort of public expectation of people around you who, you know, from the time you're really young, the, the only question they'll ask you is, do you want to be like your father or do you want to be like your mother, yeah. right? There's that external expectation. But I don't think I ever felt any pressure from my parents directly. They were always very keen that we learn music and that that we are steeped in music but what we take as a profession has entirely been our choices and uh, you know as a child i read too many john grisham novels so i was really excited with this idea of being a lawyer uh, and music was very much a part of our lives we were practicing we were performing all of that was happening but it never kind of occurred 
to me that this was this was a profession music is just something you do it's normal to practice to go on stage to be part of this this is this is a family thing that we do together uh, and then you know when i was finishing my law degree i realized it i'm much more passionate about music and and being a part of music so i i think it happened very organically in that sense wonderful yeah so so when do you think you really became a full blooded musician was it 18 was it 10 or was it later honestly i don't i don't think i'm qualified to to call myself a full blooded musician even now Why i'm not? Fully, i'm fully passionate about music and i think i've been fully passionate about music uh for as long as i can remember but i think it's it's still a journey to to be that well i can oh, understand what you mean because i still believe i'm on the journey and of course you're so much younger and it's quite justified that you say that <laughs> ambi as every child of extremely popular parents did the expectations from the music world bother you at any time did you feel it um uh, came in the way of your you know own path of doing things you know we all maybe even if your dad was uh, always playing and you were listening to music you might have like been the want to be a lawyer so you was there something else that you were interested in it so well i i think in in my case i was a little lucky that i started uh, pretty young so i when i when i was on stage at 6 i mean i wasn't thinking of any of these things So I think all these <laughs> all these thoughts came later. I think at that at that point you just say, okay, fine. I like playing the violin. Okay, go play there. And uh, and I think uh, one one thing that was really nice, um, I think with my parents as well, uh, is that I had a lot of positive experiences growing up with music. And here, uh, I mean, there's this big distinction between. positive experiences and playing well uh, i may have been, i may have been playing total nonsense but i went on stage played came back and i felt good about it um so i i think uh, that was really nice and i think uh, as i grew older then you start i start thinking about okay fine how do i find my own voice and how do i uh because when i think when i was growing up i just started playing with appa uh the best compliment somebody could give me at that point at the end of a concert was you sounded just like appa or when he was playing you you matched or whatever so that would be the happiest uh, thing for me but then uh, after a while uh, the best compliment i would receive was you know i could hear appa's thing and i could hear your thing and it was a little different uh so i think that that came and uh, to that point i think uh it was always kind of trying to find my own voice and because um if i tried to kind of match up to appa that's not possible uh and uh, i think it's it's is really nice that i've also kind of had that space at home where it's like okay fine this is what uh, appa is doing this is what ma is doing this is what bindu is doing and uh, um, take all these influences and be your own musician cook your own music <laughs> <laughs> yes <laughs> bindu tell us a bit of the time that you uh, were really growing up you know you were you both both of you ambi and you were in an immersive environment what was the influence of your parents in terms of shaping you up as the musician you are today well uh for ambi narayana and myself really i think the the biggest lesson that that we learned from our parents and and something that they still teach us to this day is the value of hard work and mm-hmm. you know this this whole idea of we are in charge of or in control of the input we're not in control of the output yes. so it's this whole idea of just getting up every day and and working hard towards your goals and figuring out how, so that that's one thing and the other thing is how can how can you make a life that's full of service right whatever that service has to be so the goals 
are not necessarily or shouldn't be, or they haven't been for my parents. They haven't been selfish goals, but they've really been about how can we be the best best version of ourselves and, and contribute to society in that way. So Absolutely. from a musical point of view, I think what Appa really gave us was, was an open mind, you know, because he's been a Carnatic musician, but he's also played with the greatest musicians from around the world, from across generations, different styles, genres, and, and created new music, whether it's with orchestras or jazz legends. And, you know, I think that has always been something fundamental for us, that there's no wrong style of music or there is no bad style of music. So yeah. when in my late teens, I decided that I wanted to, you know, sort of go to Berkeley and I wanted to study pop music and contemporary music, never once did he say, you know, this is not, this is not our music, you know, um, because I think for him as his whole point was, as long as you're studying and doing something well, you can make the music that speaks to your heart, sure. but you have to do it with full authenticity and, and sincerity. So I think that that's how it shaped me. Obviously, we learned Carnatic violin, we all learned piano, we all learned Carnatic vocal, I learned Western classical vocal as well. So we've done all of those things. And, and I mean, the, those learnings were there. But I think this was the larger takeaway. Like uh, I told Ambi that, you know, he cooks his own music. So now I'm going to tell you something. <laughs> Yours is the decoction. You got everything and you took the essence of what you wanted. <laughs> <laughs> Ambi, you began, began learning from your dad um, when you were three. You started at three? Yes, yes. Oh, I can't even imagine that image. <laughs> so cute. Wasn't the violin bigger than you? <laughs> so actually, we have these tiny violins. Uh, so I, we still have that. I think uh, Mahati also has uh, kind of played those violins. And so it starts very small and it's bigger. Okay. So what did you feel were the highlights of his teaching? Now, since you've taken violin as your main, you know, core profession, definitely I think his influence would be large. Uh, you already answered that, that you want to find your own music, you want to find your own space. But uh, there must have been a phase where, you know, you were really his shadow. And then you, you were itching to get out of the shadow and find your own, yes, cook your own music. Yeah, actually, so that that happened, and and for me, I think uh, I remember uh, a kind of I, that's kind of happened inch by inch. Uh, mm -hmm. I remember even things like um, when I was ten, eleven. Uh, Appa would always kind of if there was a concert, whatever. If I had to play fifteen minutes, twenty minutes, half an hour, whatever, uh, I would sit with Appa, and then he would say, "Okay, for this concert." You play this, 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 and then. So I remember once going on stage, and I didn't feel like playing that. Uh, <laughs> I was, I think, like, I I was supposed to play abogi or something, and then I was on stage, and all I felt was like playing Mohanam. <laughs> so then, then I went to Appa, and then I said, you know, I I feel like playing Mohanam. So then um. Appa was like, no, you've not practiced, you've not worked on Mohanam, you go, you play Abogi. Uh, so very, very sadly, I went and played Abogi. And the entire time, entire time I was playing Abogi in my head, I was like, if I played Mohanam, I would be playing better. I don't feel like playing this. So, <laughs> so then I came off stage and then um, I had a big argument with my dad. And said, see, I would have played better, but I didn't play well because you made me play a piece that I didn't want to play. So uh, <laughs> so I told him, next time I will play what I want to play. He was just looking at me and he's like, okay, go ahead. <laughs> he realized you've grown. <laughs> yeah. I, and also, I don't think Ambi's ever been an obedient child. I need to put this out there. So it's not <laughs> like, oh, my father told me I had to play. So I sadly went up and played. In his normal <laughs> life also, he's not, he used to play cricket inside the house. Yeah. And so I don't think. So, so he's a drama king. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yeah. And, but I think, I think in, in general, my, my dad has, uh, he's always kind of a perfectionist. So um, even like, uh, forget music. I mean that that part is known, but 
uh, if he walks into a room and the curtain is not okay, he'll go first and <laughs> try to fix the curtain. So I, I think uh, that is kind of uh, uh, rubbed off a little bit on us. So uh, whether whether we whether we kind of work on the same things or or have the same levels of perfection, at least he's made us see these things. Right. <laughs> so uh, is this style very grueling? Kind of. I mean like you have to practice very much because I know, you know, you do the three speeds or four speeds sometimes of the Varnam and that requires complete mastery of the bow, right? So, yeah. <laughs> tell us something about that. So, it is it is um, very grueling and I think uh, in that sense, uh, I mean, I see it differently now because I'm a little older, um, but I, I, at that age, uh, I would think that yes, he's he's very uh, he's very hard on us and all of that. I would I would feel when when I was a teenager. But I think uh, what makes it easier to look at it now is he doesn't give himself an inch either. So it's not like he's making us do things that. So if uh, so, I remember this um, this very vividly. Uh, um, so as you know, I I love watching cricket and all of that during the two thousand seven World Cup. Um, the matches were happening in West Indies. So, uh, matches were going on till like 3.30 in the morning. And, and uh, so, uh, it was during summer holidays. So, I started watching. So, up I saw first day I watched till 3.30. Second day I watched till 3.30. Third day he comes down with his laptop with some composing work. Okay, if you're anyway going to be staying up, let's work. You keep the TV there. Let, let that happen on mute. Let's sit and work. So very sad looking at the TV and then we started working. And then so every day during the World Cup, we were staying up till 3.30 and working. So um, wow. so he is kind of like that. And uh, um, but but I, I think, uh, like I said, he he's if he makes me stay up till 3.30, he's staying up till 4.30. He always stays an hour after that. So uh, so there's there's no excuses allowed. <laughs> That in itself is a motivation, yes. Bindu, your uh, Mahati, she's 10 years old. She launched her first video, How We Feel. Right? Last year? Or the yeah, other? Yeah, last year, last year. Okay. So how have you groomed Mahati? Any difference between Appa grooming you and you grooming Mahati? Honestly, I can't take credit for grooming Mahati at all. Okay. I, I always uh, say quite sadly, honestly, that uh, Ambi and I belong to what is called the sandwich generation, where we can get scolded by our parents and we can also get scolded by our children. <laughs> um, so Mahati's actually been playing Carnatic violin again since she was since she was a toddler. She has this the tiniest violin, and and so her first uh, her first time that she played the violin was Bijadashmi when she was a year and a half. And so she's she's actually been groomed by Appa more than anybody else, and I think he's been her largest musical influence. And so Carnatic violin uh, and Carnatic vocal at Sapa is what she's been doing throughout. She also kind of likes Western music as well. So she plays Western classical piano um, and she does Western vocal, contemporary and classical as well. And she's always been into gymnastics because she's honestly a little monkey. Uh, she's not little anymore. She's, she's a my sized monkey. Uh, and recently she started uh, being excited about the guitar and the ukulele as well. And she, she's been learning songwriting. So how this song came about was she heard me playing some chord progressions at home just randomly. And she's like, so what, what chord progression are you playing? So I'm like, oh, it's it's a very simple one, four, five. You know, it's just I'm playing it again. And she's like, show me. And then I showed her and she she learned how to play it uh, in, in a couple of minutes. And, and then she wrote a song over it. And then um, she went to Sanjeev, my husband. She went to Ambi, and she went to everybody else, saying, "Okay, this is this is my song. Can we record it as a secret for Amma?" Oh. And so she she recorded this song. They helped her polish it. They played the parts, and then she she then she came to me. And she's like, "Amma, I've done this song. Uh, help me polish the lyrics, and I want to make a video of it. And in this video, uh, I want to do gymnastics, and you know, I I want to shoot the video. So I'm like." Okay, if you've planned everything, let's let's do it. But I said no compromises on other work. 
So the only day we could get the crew to come in from Chennai to shoot and it was fixed way in advance was the day that she had a math exam and luckily school was online. So she actually had to write her math exam in the car when we're going from the, the, the gymnastic shoot to the other part shoot and she did it. Uh, she didn't do very well in math, let me be honest, but I, I, I think she's kind of on her own trip and I can't really take credit for it at all. No, but I appreciate the fact that you allowed her to do it. I mean, see, you didn't stop her, but just because the math exam was there. Yeah, yeah, that that is that is training from my dad. I think we've all kind of had concerts the night before exams, never during exams. Uh, but yeah, it, it, that was her first release of her own song. But she's been performing Carnatic Violin with Appa for for a while now. Uh, well, and she seemed to do all of it: guitar, violin, vocal. My God, she's just excited about it. She's just interested in these different things so her first performance so if if i if i uh, don't point this out uh, i'll have to deal with appa later so her first performance was actually at siddhi vinayak mandir in uh, in mumbai when she was three years old this is just her first original release of her own song that she did last year hmm. three six ten oh my god all of you are like too grown for your age <laughs> You're too grown up. Uh, amazing, but that it, it still, you know, goes to the next generation, music. Like they don't shun it and they want to be in it. That's wonderful. Ambi, tell us about the bands that both of you are part of and how did the idea come by? And basically, what is the difference between the two bands? Is it the music that you cover or is it the essence of the concept or what is it? So, uh, Binder and I started uh, Subramania in 2013. 2013. Uh, so, at, at that time, actually, that was kind of the first time we really started working together musically. Uh, because before that, what would end up happening is that we would do a lot of these family concerts. So, Appa would play, Ma would uh, sing, then I would I would play one piece with Appa, one piece with Ma, and then and then we would do one piece together, and then finally we would kind of uh, so it was um, we would kind of technically do stuff together, but we never really worked on music that we were both comfortable with in that sense. So uh, we kind of wanted to uh, create music where we both were very comfortable. And uh, because we were doing uh, musically very different things, uh, mm -hmm. what ended up happening was either I would try to fit in in one of her songs or she would try to fit in in, in one of my songs. Uh, so that kind of uh, started off that way. And I think Subramania was very interesting, uh, is very interesting for us uh, because um, we kind of use this as a space to collaborate with a lot of different people. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, and not really worry about uh, fitting it into a genre as such. So, um, like, for example, we were uh, really, really fascinated by this uh, musician from Senegal who plays the kora and, and sings. Uh, so we had the great opportunity to work with Solo Sissoko. And, and for us, at that, at that point, it was like, okay, so how do we do something where, um, where he feels as comfortable as we do in this space. Um, or uh, I remember we, we went and uh, we had the great opportunity to work with uh, Robbie Lakatos, this incredible gypsy violinist. And uh, I was like completely a fanboy of, of, of him and everything that he was doing. So uh, I remember after spending that time with him, uh, immediately uh, so many ideas came to me and I was like, okay, how do we, how do we incorporate some of these things that he's taught me and uh, how how do we use it um, in in our music uh, so so i think that has kind of been the space of subramania and uh, for us it's it's continuously evolving and we're trying to uh, see how we can bring in different influences and and uh, continue learning in in that sense okay uh, for the taishadam project um, We've done with uh, Mahesh and Akshay. And so by the way, how did the name come about? Uh, Bindu, you want to explain this? <laughs> See, Abhi's too embarrassed to explain this, so he's uh, he's giving it to me. All, uh, of, us, 
all of us love Thai sadhu. Maybe that's <laughs> the reason that you know you're drawn to the name immediately. <laughs> yeah, I mean, for for the Thai sadhu project, the idea was Thai sadhu. At the end of the day, is your is your comfort food. It's the food of your yeah. soul. Yeah. Just like our music. At the end of the day, you you can go and do everything else, but you know, you sort of your traditional music is is the music of your soul. And also, you know, sometimes people will be like, oh, Thai sadhu isn't cool. It isn't this. But then you know that it's it's really so. It's really, really important. Uh, so we wanted to kind of use that as a play and say, you know what, Thai Sadam is cool. Our traditional music is cool, uh, and and it means a lot to us. With Subramania, the way that the name came about was um, when Appa was touring in Russia in the 1980s. They had these big posters of his name, but it was in Cyrillic, and somehow Subramaniam became Super Maniac. Uh, and obviously, my dad is not quite a maniac, so <laughs> that 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 was a, a running joke in our but family. That adds a cool touch to the Subramanian, the maniac. <laughs> so when we started the band, we wanted to be Subramania. So uh, yeah, about the Thai Sadam project, Ambi. Yeah, so so there actually um, the idea there since uh, Mayesh brought in a lot of electronic elements and uh, more of that kind of production. Uh, so for us, uh, Thai Shadam project is a little more Carnatic and a little more electronic, where uh, Subramania is probably a little more world music and it's uh, more of your uh, traditional band with, yeah, with your world percussion and your keyboards and your, your guitars, but this is more produced. Okay. Bindu, now off music, off OFF. Mm -hmm. You love cats and have five of them. Wow. One itself is, I think, it's a handful household. How do you manage the five and why did you name them ragas? You like calling them Bhairavi? I'm yeah, that, that's actually what we do. We go Bhairavi, Todi, Kapi, and, uh, you know, so it, I mean, I'm I'm kind of the crazy cat lady. I've, I've reached that point in life. This is my water bottle. So I've reached the crazy cat lady point some time ago. Um, oh. And somehow in our Sapa centers as well, we end up having cats. So at Sapa, we've got Bilahari. Uh, and then when we opened our Sapa Mumbai Center, also we did the puja and everything, and it was on the fifth floor. And suddenly a cat walks into the building. And Ambi and I are looking at each other, and we're like, this is this is a sign from God. So what did you call the cat? We did, I don't remember what we named him, actually. What I, Do you remember, Ambi? But all our cats have from, other from, from today, he is Anand Bhairavi. <laughs> So it's just what comes to your mind at that point. <laughs> Maybe they will surprise you by play by mewing a raga someday because they listen to you so much. <laughs> that would be the the icing on the cake. <laughs> that that would be funny. Yeah. So um, do they listen to music when you sing or play or do they trouble you or they meow along, they do. Uh, and especially if Mahati is playing the piano or something like that, you'll have one cat on the piano next to her. Uh, <laughs> I don't know if they think they're contributing when they're walking across the keys. But, uh, <laughs> contributing, yeah. Uh, so what is this uh, background scoring that you've done of uh, Sardar? Uh, so uh, this actually, uh, I think... It's, uh, I really, really, really enjoyed uh, working with Shantanu Moitraji. And uh, I think before this as well, uh, I've had uh, the, the great fortune of working with him and knowing him as a person. So I think um, uh, probably when when I kind of meet him, maybe 20% is, is music and 80% is everything else. And uh, I, I really enjoy uh, uh, kind of picking his brain and... Uh, uh, and I consider him a mentor also uh, mm -hmm. as a composer. So uh, uh, he called me for, for this and he said, you know, uh, we're doing this and uh, this is uh, probably the first time in or uh, in a Bolly Bollywood, like a mainstream movie where uh, I don't want to use uh, any songs. I just want it to be like one of these Hollywood movies where it's a completely instrumental background score and I want the violin to lead this uh, so obviously I was I was thrilled and uh, um, it was it was a really really great experience for me and uh, um, 
to that point, uh, uh, we've done a couple of background scores earlier. Uh, but then when when I went and, and saw the way he worked and saw his, then I'm like, wow, okay, there was a huge difference between what I was doing and what uh, what he was doing. And it was it's uh, always an incredible learning experience. And uh, uh, one really nice thing is um, he always seems to get uh, the best people on board, uh, both in terms of skill and in terms of attitude. So I've, I've never Can met... self-compliment, Ambi? Yeah, <laughs> sure, yeah. why not? I the way my head went. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> He's got okay. such a good eye for violinists, you know. He always chooses <laughs> the, be the best-looking violinists who play that, right, Ambi? Right? No harm, no <laughs> harm in being happy about yourself. <laughs> Okay, removing myself for a second, but I haven't, I haven't met one. So I, I've, I've done uh, four projects with him, and I haven't met one person that I don't like as a person in in, in any of these projects. So uh, I think um, the way he works is is very very interesting. Yes, we have more questions about the Sapa Academy. Whose idea was it? Sapa? <laughs> uh, the idea of having the academy itself was was Appa and Ma's idea. Obviously. The name? The name was our brother Narayana's because we were all sitting uh, together and trying to figure out, you know, like acronyms. And Appa was saying, you know, how can we how can we make lamp fit or how can we, you know, so we're all brainstorming. And then and then uh, Narayana's like, you know, we should call it Sapa. And, and then everyone's like, yeah, what, like why yeah, didn't we think of that? Yeah. So, so yeah, it was. It yeah, was after Sapa's uh, emergence, there have been some samas and uh, sagas and all that. You know, like <laughs> you trigger the thought process. So now this academy offers self-paced courses by top musicians. So, and I also see that this institution has so many youngsters taking care of so many things. Of being at the helm as well. So, how did this come about? Because usually we have a faculty, a very you know, kind of structured, uh, experienced faculty, and the others are much junior and things like that. But how did you change the entire working style? So, um, I think music education is something that we've always been very passionate about as a family. So Tata was a teacher. So mm -hmm. I think it's, it's something that that really is, is our way of paying tribute to the legacy that we come from. And we also really strongly feel that, that music is something that everyone should have access to, not just people who are from musical families. And this whole nature versus nurture debate, I really believe a lot of it is nurture. So when people say, oh, music is in your blood, I think a lot of it is just that when you come from a family of music, your exposure is much earlier. Now, there, there is a certain thing as talent, but talent doesn't necessarily run in blood or families. And some of our best students today are, are kids who come from first generation musical families. Mm -hmm. So the, the aim at that point, the ambition was really to make sure that anybody who wanted to learn music or anybody who wanted their children to learn music would have a fun and meaningful way to do that. So when we started, uh, you know, Mahati was really small at that time. So it was my dream to, to have what is now the Sapa Baby program, where I wanted a very fun and engaging way to teach Carnatic music to babies. It, as simple as that. So we, uh, you know, experimented a lot. The first Sapa Baby textbook, you know, making it colorful and making it bright. And then now we have baby Dikshita, we have baby Tyagaraja, we have baby Mirabai, all of these, you know, ways to engage the kids. We put Shruti boxes inside stuffed animals, soft toys. So kids would sit with it in their lap and they'll, they would practice. And uh, I think that's where it started from. And over time, it's really grown into a hub for people who are passionate about music and want to be musicians. So this whole idea of young musicians engaging with each other. So it's not just Carnatic or Hindustani music, but it's also Western classical and contemporary music and a lot of interdisciplinarity. So we have students who are doing, you know, Western songwriting and uh, Carnatic violin, and they're creating something that's totally unique or kids who are playing the cajon uh, and the mridangam and seeing how they can, they can form things. And, 
I think we're so fortunate to have such a young, inspirational teaching force. Most of our teachers are, you know, engineers, doctors, lawyers who are mm. so passionate about music that they've chosen to leave those other things and come here. And for Ambi and myself, it's also been how do we create meaningful environments for them, for people who are passionate about music? How do we create spaces for them to collaborate? How do we create meaningful careers for them? How do we make music a viable option? So you're doing your teaching, you're doing your performing, and you're really passionate about what you're doing. So you're happy to get up in the morning every day. Yeah. Uh, and then it expanded into music in schools, which is, again, something that is really great because this idea of community music or everybody being able to make some music together, whether they want to be musicians or not, you know, whether it's for social emotional learning or just learning to sing in different languages or just standing in a circle and, and sharing that energy or vibrations that come with music. It's it's a it's a really beautiful thing. I think we're just really fortunate to to be in it. I, I don't think we can take credit for it, but we're just fortunate to be here in this time and space. Ambi, you have co-authored over 20 textbooks, including India's first series of textbooks dedicated to the teaching of Carnatic violin. So how did this aspect of, you know, it's more musicology, actually. Uh, how did this aspect appeal to you and what made you get into such a project? Well, I, I think uh, all of this was closely related to everything else that we were doing at SAPA. And uh, I think uh, for me, uh, especially, I mean, if we're talking about the violin, uh, I kind of learned the Western violin and Carnatic violin kind of side by side. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, one thing I felt was when I, when I was learning the Western violin, there are so many books there are so many uh, things that are specific for the violin. So when I would go uh, have a class, they'll say, okay, now take this book and, and this is to work on this particular technique. Or um, if, you have a, if you have a weakness with this part of the bow, uh, take this, uh, this method, uh, which was written uh, 100 years ago by this amazing violinist or, or all of that. Uh, but then uh, for Carnatic music, if we were to look at notation, if we were to look at something, it's um, it is kind of vocal centric and it is very um, one size fits all. So whether you are a, a singer or a violinist or a veena player, we would all go through the same Ganamrita Bodhini or we'd go through that Varna Manjari and and all of that, which which are great. But if um, if you are a violinist specifically struggling with something. Um, where uh, like uh, what bowing should I use or what fingering do we need to use or uh, how do we improve this particular aspect of our playing or if you're struggling with with Tanam uh, what uh, what exercises do you need to work on before you kind of uh, do that so uh, I, I felt that uh, we need to kind of uh, do that and, and get that out there so this is something I've been very very passionate about and uh, uh, for for me, it's it's kind of uh, uh, mapping the journey and uh, and trying to remember all these different things that I learned from Appa, uh, kind of uh, off the cuff when we're sitting with something and I'm struggling with something. We would he would sit for five minutes and say, okay, fine. Now let's do this. Now uh, use this in in this. So uh, it was kind of a combination of that and and trying to see how uh, we could add some new violin specific pieces. Uh, try to add a few things that would uh, make it more relevant for uh, uh, a violin learner. So we're going to hear you play now. Let's okay. quieten our talking <laughs> and get some music on. All right. What are you going to play? Uh, shall we play? Okay. Maybe some copy? Sure. My cat would be so happy. Happy <laughs> Madhuri <laughs> Thank you. 
Yes, that's a Tilana that I wrote actually last year. <laughs> Because I, I heard Nadir Didi, you know, I could hear that in the. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> wonderful, wonderful. There's so many things that I need to ask you, but I look at the clock and it's almost one hour. So I'm going to ask you the prime questions. Both of you are youth delegates at the United Nations for the Sri Chinmay Peace Meditation Group. So what do you do? and what are the activities of this group either of you could answer that or maybe both uh well i i think uh, one amazing thing that they really do uh, so shri chinmoy was uh, such an incredible and inspirational person and uh, i think one uh, amazing idea uh, that i've kind of picked up from that is that he believed that peace and and spirituality comes through what uh, you are passionate about so so I, he uh, didn't really focus too much on the religion aspect but he would focus on uh, getting people to really do what they are passionate about so uh, they also have uh, like these peace runs where um, we know a lot of people are there who uh, find find their peace and find their calm by running and uh, and that's great and he also used to do this uh, this weightlifting uh, thing as well uh, which which was amazing and because he believes that peace came through that for him and of course through music uh, a lot of people there uh, also uh, find their peace through music uh, so i think they are uh, an amazing organization that kind of uh, helps other people find their peace and um, i think for us uh, i can't really take too much credit because i don't do much there but uh, what what i uh, try to do is kind of spread awareness in my own way and uh, whenever they ask me to do something whether it's playing or or talking or or uh, kind of being there at an event i i try to do that but uh, i think it's a it's a very beautiful way uh, of looking at life yes that you find peace in what you do and what you do best so bindu among the projects that you have worked upon which is the most memorable i know it's always difficult to say to, you know pinpoint just pick ones but you know where your heart has been kind of stirred by the project um if i had to choose one i would really say the first time i performed with a full orchestra uh as a soloist and that was in norway when i was 12 wow. uh it was just and and it was a composition that appa had written called the astral symphony and the idea behind this composition was 
to have a, a traditional Western classical orchestra, but then have global soloists who could then be replaced with musicians from any part of the world. So it was just such a powerful experience to be in that space with so many musicians, yeah. you know, 60, 70 Western classical musicians and the conductor and all of that, but then also these global soloists. So there was like a Finnish Kantala harp player, there was an African um, Kora player, then there was, a, you know, an Iranian Santur player, and then a, a jazz piano player, and then there was me. And so to me, I think that that has just set the benchmark for, for how collaborations can be. And I think that was one of the most powerful experiences. Obviously, there are others, but if you if yes. you make me pick one, that, that would be one. And for you, Ambi, the most memorable concert, uh, when, you were, when you feel you were the best during the collaborations? Uh, well, I, I think uh, for me, one concert that I really remember uh, was again with an, with an orchestra and um, I was having this discussion with uh, with Appa a few weeks before and uh, I think I was about 16 at that time. So Appa always kind of has a distinction between uh, musicians and, and people who play music. So uh, he was telling me that, okay, you're, you're not a musician yet. You you play music, you're, you're, you're working on music, but you're not, you can't call yourself a musician yet. Uh, so I was obviously very disappointed to hearing this. Um, so I was working and then this uh, concert happened in, in Lille in, in France. Uh, and this was with an incredible orchestra and uh, there also in these orchestra settings, it's, it can be quite intimidating because 20, 30 musicians are violinists and uh, they're all looking at you and like, okay, who's this little kid? And so you, you have to be of a certain standard otherwise. Uh, uh, so I remember kind of that concert going well. And then at the end, uh, just before going to bed, my dad is like, okay, okay, now you're a musician. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> That's so cute. So what are the future projects that you have in mind and you might uh, be likely to present? Mindu, you want to go first? Either of you can answer that because I don't know who's working on projects. <laughs> I, I think we're always working on musical things and that's exciting, whether it's uh, new songs that we're writing or new things that we're, we're composing or, or cover versions or any of that. So there's, there's always music in the works and uh, Mahati is very excited about doing a series of uh, mother-daughter collaborations. So every time she hears a song, she's like, Amma, I, I think we can do this together. So I'm, I'm very excited about, about those. Uh, and beyond that, really at SAPA, it's about how every day, how we can do something new and, and reach more people and more children and, and just create more excitement and passion around music. Mm -hmm. So Ambi, you were recently a speaker at the Jaipur Literary Festival, speaking on the Raga traditional and the contemporary. So how much do such podia help in spreading the nuances of the rich cultural heritage amongst, should we say, the next generation? And what yeah. was your experience there? Because I've heard a lot about uh, the Jaipur Literary Festival. Yeah, it's it's beautiful. And uh, one, one thing that was really, really nice, they got uh, three very kind of different speakers. So, I mean, I, I spoke a little bit from the Karatic perspective. Uh, Aman Bai was there who spoke, uh, say Ayan Bai was there who spoke about the Hindustani perspective and, mm -hmm. and Sheikh Gatti was there talking about uh, ragas in Bollywood. Uh, so it was very interesting for me also to see how um, the different thought processes are there. And uh, also, I think it was, it was, um, it's very interesting uh, because a lot of times uh, when we when we end up talking or when somebody asks us to speak, they always kind of uh, organizers come come to you two minutes before. I, I'm sure you face it. They'll say, "Okay, don't go into too much detail because yeah, yeah. they won't understand." Or or uh, all these uh, things. So even even if the audience wants to hear a little more in detail, they you're always kind of cut off and say, "Okay, don't go into too much detail. Just." Um, uh, but I think these kind of uh, things are very interesting where even for us as speakers, because you can kind of have a, a, an interesting conversation with no filters. And uh, um, 
these conversations can sometimes uh, be open ended which are which are wonderful and uh, uh, both speakers and audience members kind of are uh, are part of this uh, journey where you you come back you go in with uh, some ideas of things that you want to say but then you come back with a uh, hundred more ideas yeah but you also played the violin uh, at some points to demonstrate yes yes so at, at the end we we all kind of did uh, a small piece together and and that was uh, a lot of fun and and uh, uh, a lot some of the audience members there also come with specific questions in mind they come with uh, specific things so um, they really make you think in a different way uh, so which which i loved because i i, I went home uh, uh, with a lot of uh, uh, thoughts and uh, a lot of things challenged the way i kind of uh, looked at it Uh, Bindu, the pandemic has taken away the sheen of our industry. I mean, uh, or shall we say, did take away. It's coming back to normalcy now. Um, and you know, without live performance uh, performances, I think as performers, we felt a little kind of you know in the down. Uh, how did it feel to get back on stage? And what was your first appearance? Where was it? I think um, oh. tell us how uh, how you as a family I mean Ambi you LS Kavita ji all of you you know how you managed during the pandemic keeping your spirits up with online stuff and uh, yeah I, I mean it was I also sorry. want to see a few of them yeah it it was definitely difficult I mean and and this whole idea of being a performer and not being able to perform in person and sort of being restricted to to this little yeah. Uh, of of performing was was definitely hard, and for us, also the added challenge was how do we make music education meaningful during this time? How when you know we're working with one and a half year olds, and how do we you know ask them to sit in front of a computer and learn? Um, but with Appa and Ma, uh, Appa for I think it was the first time in probably sixty years that he wasn't able to travel as much as he wanted to. So he set up a full video production unit in his house, and uh, I think yeah. it's been an extremely extremely productive <laughs> time for him uh, and for Ma as well. Uh, and I think in addition to those performances, it was it was a great opportunity for us to make new recordings and and evaluate different ways of of connecting with people. And like you mentioned earlier, it was also great for us to make those asynchronous courses because we were able to reach out to, you know, really great musicians uh, to make courses for us because they were also at home and they also had so much to share. So whether it was Pankajudas ji or Anup Jalota ji or Samir ji or Usha Utub ji, we were able to get, you know, some some really great, uh, you know, legends to to give us their insights. So that was nice. And then. When we were able to get back on stage, it really felt like we were being released from some sort of cage, and cage. it was just so much joy, you know. And and the feedback that you get after that after the show is that, wow, that was great music, but you you also looked like you were having so much fun. And then you're like, yes, we really were having a lot of fun. So I really felt like you know like a bird with wings spread out and. Especially when you sing the ragas and all that, and you go into your own creative space, like it's, it was really amazing. I mean, to and to sing to a kind of you know near full house was very very encouraging. So now we're going to move to the firing range where the questions are going to be really sharp, and you have to be also witty and short. Ambi first, you are adept uh, in two genres of music. I'm I'm going to restrict it to two genres. The pure classical and the contemporary, where everything else comes. So, with where are you comfortable? I think I'm happy that I don't have to choose. <laughs> ah, that was a good one, <laughs> Bindu. I think you're going to say the same answer: teaching and performing. Which gets the best from you? Oh gosh, it's it's again both. Yes. I think they're two sides of the same coin. So okay, now each of these questions probably both of you can answer. You can take turns because they are. I mean, I'm sure you have different answers. Which is your first choice for a vacation? Hill, valley, beach, mountain? Mountain, mountain slash hill, definitely. 
Okay, same answer. Uh, okay, who's your best critic? Uh, my husband. My dad. I would have thought. Yes, Bindu? My husband. Huh. Really? <laughs> <laughs> I'm surrounded by too many, too many violinists. So my, my father loves me too much. Which is not saying something good about my husband at this moment, but uh, I, I <laughs> so cute. I mean, cutely worded. <laughs> okay, your favorite cuisine? Are you foodies? First of all, yes, absolutely. Very well. Okay. Okay. Apart from Indian food, Chinese. Apart food. from apart from Thai sadhan. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and potato roast. What else? <laughs> So I, I, I love Chinese food. and Thai. Huh. Mexican food for me. Mm. True or Japanese. Japanese. Yeah. Okay, now we spoke about uh, the critic. Now we're going to talk about uh, the best um, feedback that you got. You know, like this person saying you did well. It stayed in your mind as an inspiration. Bindu, for me, my dad. Yeah, my dad. Uh, and and kind of when he says, when you sang that, it moved me. Because I think for him, there's there's just so much about the soul of the music, which is which is beyond technical perfection. Technical perfection to him is is the baseline. But when he says something about the emotionality behind my singing, that that is the highest form. I can't think of anything higher than that. That would be more meaningful to me. I can see you're moved as you answer. <laughs> Just your facial expression. <laughs> you are me. So uh, I think, so two things. One one is the, I was telling about Appa, uh, calling me a musician finally. I yeah. think that's something I won't forget. Uh, also, uh, when I met uh, Robbie Lakatos, the violinist, and, uh, and then... Uh, so we, we, we had a tour uh, in India for our uh, our festival that my father does. Uh, he had come for, for that. And then um, we had happened to kind of, um, we had a tour um, in Brussels two weeks after that. And he's from Brussels. So uh, after one of these shows, we kind of just um, mentioning, oh, you know, we're coming to Brussels. We would love to see you then. Uh, and then the next day he comes, comes to us and says, you know, if you're coming to Brussels, would you be okay if I arranged a concert? Whatever, whatever I can do, and then let, we can play together. And then I was like, "Wow, this is the kind of the biggest compliment that I can receive." And he's he is a kind of absolute master of his field, and uh, that was very, 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 uh, uh, very encouraging for me. A fan moment that is very dear to you, both of you. Um, you want to go first, Tambi? Go ahead, go ahead. Uh, I would say when I got to be in the presence of Al Jiro, Stanley Clark, and George Duke, and and perform with the three of them, it was just amazing. And especially Al Jiro, looking at what a what a humble human being he was. Uh, he he had so many Grammys. I don't even know how many he had, but. Uh, I was so moved by being in his presence that I touched his feet. And he's like, what are you doing? And I'm like, well, from where I'm from, this is my way of saying that I have very deep respect for you. And then he he smiled, he laughed, and then he bent over, crazy tall guy. He bent over and he touched my feet. And he's like, you know what? I have respect for you too. And I was I was so shocked. I didn't know how to react. But, but that was a total fangirl moment for me. Okay. Ambi is going to talk about a different fan moment. You know, like you play and then among the thousands, one person comes up and says something which kind of bowls you over. So, well, uh, one moment that I'll never forget, after a concert, there was this very elderly gentleman uh, who I think he was close to 80. And he came up to me and said, uh, uh, you know, I've I've heard instrumental music for for 60 years, I've gone to concerts everywhere, but today my soul is happy. So wow. I was, I was just completely <laughs> smiling for the next week. 
Oh, I love that. If if I have to answer, if I understood the question incorrectly, I will answer correctly now. No, no. I mean, it's, it's, there's a, there are many interpretations to that. So I thought, oh yes. Until uh, you answer, I didn't realize that that aspect also lay in the question. <laughs> but for me, it would really be when um, when someone contacted me and said, you know, my baby's a few months old, and to get her to stop crying, she needs to hear your voice. And yeah. I was just. I was so moved by that. Like it, yeah. it was just a very, very powerful thing. So um, an incident that taught you both something, you know, you take a lesson from that. Some incident, maybe good or not so. Uh, so for me, it was actually maybe one uh, one lesson that I don't, I can't really forget is uh, when we first worked with this uh, incredible saxophone player Ernie Watts, uh, and he had just he had just flown from the U.S. and uh, we had come from Bangalore. The concert was in Bombay, so um, he must have been so exhausted uh, and all that. He's he's my dad's age, and uh, uh, he I think he was in his sixties at that time. Again, he's one. Uh, more Grammys than he can probably count and, and all of that. Uh, so we had uh, we had rehearsal and sound check till about 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Then me being a 16-year-old, 17-year-old kid is like, you know what, I'm tired, I'm hungry, I want to go and take a nap before the concert. Otherwise, you know, I won't be able to play properly. I, I, I'm uh, thinking all these things in my head. And then uh, I kind of knock in his uh, in his green room and like, you know, why don't we, we go to the hotel and, and we can rest a little bit, eat something and then come back for the concert. Then I see he's gotten some peanuts and he's, uh, he's like, don't worry, you know, I have these peanuts here. I want to practice a little bit because I've just come. I, yeah, I want, I need to practice scales before the concert. But you please go. You you please have lunch. And then I was looking at him and I'm like, okay. <laughs> Can I go? Can I stand here now? So you see how much people put uh, put effort uh, yeah. kind of before. Uh, That's why I guess they are there. You know where yeah, they are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So then, then I, I saw that and I, I've seen some musicians how much effort they put in. And then you realize, okay, fine. If I want to be a tenth of that, then uh, I need to kind of also <laughs> stop no, complaining. So much. I need bring peanuts or maybe some candy. <laughs> yeah, I know. You, Bindu? I think, again, it's these experiences you have when you were young. Um, we had uh, Hubert Laws, the flautist, who, you know, is, is again a legend. and. He was having a conversation workshop with Oystein Badzik, uh, the tuba soloist, which is very rare. And the most exciting thing for me is they were saying, you know, we're asking like, how much do you practice? And we used, Amir and I used to ask everybody this, how many hours do you practice? This is a standard question. Uh, and they came up with this idea of, you know, perfection is for practice. So when you practice, you practice till you're perfect. You practice not only till you're perfect, but you practice till you're incapable of being wrong but then you have to let it all go when you go to stage because when you're on stage you're not worried about perfection it's your engagement with your art with your audience so yes. that was an incredible takeaway that that experience of hearing from these musicians these perspectives what was the line that you said perfection like practice is for perfection or perfection is for practice but when you go on stage you have to let it go Yes, truly so. Okay, we finish with music again. One raga that features in every concert of yours, Ambi. Uh, I don't think I have one raga that features in every concert. So Not even I, I, Sindhu Bhairavi? Oh, I love Sindhu Bhairavi. Yes. But um, I, uh, everybody makes fun of me at home for this. But I, I have an Excel sheet where I, I kind of uh, write every concert that I've done. Uh, with with the, all the pieces that I've done, so that if I so if I go to a place after five years, I need to make sure that I don't repeat something. Yeah. But uh, everybody thinks I'm too structured for my own good. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think this is a different way of looking at your you know working style. 
<laughs> right. Bindu has to finish with music, singing, just a few lines, whatever you feel like from your heart. Hmm. Okay. Uh, if if uh, Ambi and I were in the same room, we could have done something together. But I guess since he's yeah. not, what should I do? Okay. I wasn't prepared for this. I know I caught I'm, you off the. <laughs> you did. You did. I shouldn't be singing in front of you. I have no right. But uh, I'm going to sing a couple of lines from the first song that we wrote uh, together. Um, and it's called Days in the Sun. And we wrote it for uh, George Duke, the musician. And the song is kind of about longing and loss and uh, what it feels like, you know? Mm. I give all my days in the sun to stand with you in the rain. I give all my days in the sun to help me feel your pain. I give all my days in the sun to see you once again. See you once again. See you once again. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Ambi and Bindu, for taking time to be on the show. It's been such a pleasure seeing your smiling faces and, you know, a, a different way of looking at things. Because Thanks. I've seen so much of music, been with so much of music. You know, it was really good to hear your perspective of certain questions. <laughs> Thank, Thank you so much. much. I hope you continue this happiness in your music and your newness and, of course, your service to society and to children. I was going to ask you, when you spoke about the children, uh, about Shruti boxes being stuffed into toys and all that, I was just going to ask you, how old were you talking about? One year? One and a half? Do they even manage to sit in one place to listen to music, you know? So, the the three-year-olds sit, but yeah. So may all of this continue and may you innovate newer things. Um, and of course, I wish Mahati all the very best because I think she's already being shaped. And you, I mean, I would, I can imagine that picture, Ellis, Kavita Ji, Ambi, you. I'm not going to forget your husband, Sanjeev, right? <laughs> And then Mahati sitting there, and all of you doing something together. That would be so wonderful <laughs> to watch and listen to. Uh, we are so proud. We as a society, we as a fraternity are so proud that music has been transferred, like the Olympic torch, from dad to son to daughter to daughter. And we <laughs> just continue to live and breathe music. Thank you. Is there something that you want to say to the audience? What I want to say to you is I'm so grateful for this, uh, to have had this conversation with you, uh, to listen to you sing, to listen to you speak. And it's truly been an honor and a joy. Thank you so much for this. Thank you. Yeah, Please express my namaskaram to uh, Kavita ji and Elisa. Absolutely. And thanks. Thanks so much. This it's been so much fun and of course you know i've i've been a huge fan of you for a very 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 long time and this is is nice to kind of have this freewheeling yes. chat and uh i know when we meet at airports or venues or you know at hotels where we stay i remember i met you all at uh, brussels i think in Belgium. yes 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 <laughs> so you know there's hardly time to talk because we are so preoccupied and you know the fatigue of travel and stuff but this was like though it's virtual I almost feel that you're just sitting across the room and I'm talking to you guys. Thank you once again. <laughs> Bye. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye. So Bindu and Ambi come from such a grand legacy and they're surrounded by the largest of the ambience of uh, their father, the grandfather's aura all the time. Yet they have we see from the conversation and understand from their views that they have brought in their own creativity and how much of diversity uh, within the realms of their inheritance. 
So I enjoy talking to them and I am sure all of you enjoy listening to them. So coming back to us, while earlier one could say the world is limping back to normalcy, today the limp has turned into a gallop. Channels have opened up, but as in our earlier episode, Professor Sudha Seshian had mentioned the virus is not fully gone and is lurking somewhere still. So let us not throw caution to the wind and let us continue to be masked up where necessary. You know best when you're in crowds, you need to wear a mask. Uh, and of course, it's for your own safety and for the safety of the others. So until the next episode, See you all, have good days ahead and happy birthdays and happy wedding anniversaries to those of you who are, who are having it in May. We'll get back with the next exciting celebrity as soon as she or he is ready. Tara.